Check, check. Hello. Cool. Cool. Drop into this one. Yeah. So welcome back to Save It for the Blind podcast. We're here with Carson Odegaard, my co-host, and Captain Sean Olagi with the Hunter. He's the Hunter Education Administrator with California Department of Fish and Wildlife. So, Sean, thanks for coming on today. We've known sure. each other for a long time. And we're just kind of talking about your career, Hunter Education, Hunter Recruitment in California. So... Why don't you kind of start off about yourself, your career, hunting background, et cetera? All right. Um, lifelong resident of Los Banos. I grew up there. I was born there. Um, so I'm in the heart of the grasslands. And I saw you had a podcast regarding yeah, teal being shot in the grasslands. <laughs> teal City. No? That, yeah. is, that is definitely what we shoot. Um, lucky enough to belong to a really good duck club in the grasslands that uh, we call it. The, it's the Oakland Land and Cattle Company. It, uh, Oakland Land and Cattle Company special is uh, usually the limit of sprig and the rest heel. Nice. So that's what we try to, to go home with at the end of the day. <clears throat> um, being raised in Las Vegas, it was uh, typically um, you entertain yourself with your BMX bike, a fishing pole, or a BB gun or whatever. So I grew up hunting and fishing pretty much from the time I could ride a bike, uh-huh. you know. Uh, didn't know there was hunting seasons when I first started. Uh, <laughs> did, you grow up, did you grow up in a hunting family or were you? Um, my dad used to take me hunting, but just to pretty much get out of the house. Okay. okay right. Okay. So, yeah. I mean, he had a gun. I had a 22 that I pretty much shot everything with, gotcha, you know, gotcha. so there were, might've been some mistakes or stuff <laughs> that happened back then, but, uh, I ate everything that I, that I shot. So there you go. that was good. Um, but just grew up in the Valley there, uh, Hunting and fishing is where my passion. I uh, went to school, college, thinking I was going to be in med. So I was a biochemistry, cell biology wow. major. Um, finally finished my degree with biological sciences, uh, BS and that, and was getting into agriculture, you know, uh, looking at crop consulting. And uh, farming was just not my thing. I mean, I, I didn't mind it, but I wanted something where I knew I was going to get paid every month and get, yeah. you know, benefits <laughs> and all that stuff. So I applied for... Uh, fish and Wildlife, uh, well, Fish and Game Warden at that time. And in 1999, I started my career at the academy there in Napa. And mm. it was good. And right out of the academy, I got to go home. I was the chances smart. of that are, wow. That's pretty, that was pretty rare back then, right? Like yeah. Like to get stationed I was where actually, you wanted to be? I was actually um, hired for San Diego. Okay. Oh, wow. And halfway through the academy, they say, hey, the San Diego position hasn't come open uh, here's a list of positions that are open, and I saw Los Banos, and I was like, "Man, do I want to go home and uh, <laughs> talk to my some old friends about yeah. some of the things that we used to do together?" Um, but uh, no, it was it was um, a blessing, honestly, to be able to go back home. Um, you know, the family's there, yeah. so my community's there. That's that's where I was born and raised. So that's that's the where my support really is. But um, so I got to be a game warden for. Uh, I was working on my seventh year when I got promoted to the um, hunter education coordinator. Okay. And that's where I met you. Yeah. Um, I don't know when you started, but I got that in 2006. And uh, I remember George Oberstadt was with CWA at that yeah. time. And I think that was year two, Lidge, you got under yep, him. Absolutely. Uh, as far as the hunter education program. Mm-hmm. So I've uh, been in with hunter education since 2006. And just last year, I got promoted to captain, which was the ad- administrative position for the fish, uh, fish and Wildlife's Hunter Education Program. So that's where I've been for the last year, and i uh, got some few, few years left. I'm going to try to go out with a bang and make sure the Hunter Education Program is where it should be um, before I go out. Was was educating a passion of yours, you know, leading up to that? Because I mean, you're a field game warden yeah. for what seven years, yes. and then you're just like, I feel like that's a big change, you know. You know, in a sense, in a sense, yeah. I w- I was very fortunate. Like actually, okay, talk about the education part. I was uh, applying for um, my teaching credential right before oh, right. I got okay. oh, hired. Okay. So I was trying to get into Chapman College or something to finish a you know single subject credential. And that's when I started the process for the game board, and I got accepted. So, you know, yeah, teaching is kind of something I really like to do. I mean, the people who do want to share and provide probably have a teaching background. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I've always been in that sense, um, you know, a teacher. 
uh, when I came on as a game warden, I had a really good mentor uh, as far as my local neighboring warden. He taught Hunter Ed and said, man, you need to make sure you teach Hunter education. This is really important for your, your community and who you are in your community. Uh, back then, you know, game wardens were the game warden and not mm-hmm. just a game warden. Mm-hmm. Everybody knew who you were yeah. you know, in your community. And uh, this was one way you solidified that was by teaching Hunter education because um, the people in your community knew you as their instructor and a cool guy that you they could talk to. It just opened up the, the doors more so as far as, you know, community policing, just letting them know that you were approachable yeah. at that time. So um, that was a big part. I, I taught Hunter education in my town uh, with the help of the local sportsman's club. Uh, we teach two to three classes a year, and uh, that's kind of what padded my resume as far as getting the position that I went into. So it, was, it wasn't like I was just trying to promote. I was like, I knew Hunter Education. I followed my, you know, up with it mm-hmm. and got into the position that. Did you did. ever miss the field work? I'll tell you, it was hard to let go after the promotion of letting go of my responsibilities that I had before as yeah. a game warden. And then everybody's always calling you because they know <laughs> yeah, I'm like, not the guy anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And passing that over to someone else was difficult. Yeah. Uh, and the fun stuff. I mean, being a game warden, cool job. I right. mean, you're out there getting paid to do the stuff that you would do recreationally wise, right? Mm-hmm. You know, like um, every weekend during duck season, you're hunting. You're just not holding a gun, you know, when you're out yeah. there in the field, and you're trying to think of okay, where should I be today? If where's you know where are you going to get the most results? So yeah, same thing. You know, you you follow that, and so it is a hunt. And really, honestly, when I was a game warden, um, my hunting uh, well, desire was a little bit less because I was doing it every day. Yeah, I guess and so actually pulling the trigger wasn't really that important. And when it when it changed was when I had a, a son that I wanted to take hunting. And so I had to make sh- – that was one reason I did the promotion too is so I had more opportunity to do that. Yeah, that, that makes total sense. Do they require um, game wardens now to be hunter ed instructors? Uh, we teach them in the academy. Uh, oh, so, really? Right, right, so them, they come out of the academy yeah, with their hunter ed. Yeah, we, uh, when we're in the academy, they have one day where we're teaching them hunter education because yeah. – some people don't have a hunting background, even as a warden, mm-hmm. a cadet. They're there. Maybe they're fishermen. Maybe they're ocean, you know, people. And I don't really have that much ocean experience. So yeah. I mean, that's there's certain things that it's weird when the public thinks of a game warden. They think we know all aspects <laughs> yeah. of everything. You all know, the different type of rock fishing. You're yeah, on, exactly. You're on the I mean, side of the state. <laughs> yeah, you're in the desert working. Yeah. And it's like, hey, what rock fish is this? It's like we don't know. You know, not all of us yeah. know that. Even when it comes to ducks. Uh, there's people like myself who was – they were born and raised in the valley hunting ducks. We know ducks. Mm-hmm. Uh, asking some guy off the coast or some gal off the coast to identify every puddle duck or every diving duck with just the wing, uh, you might not be able to get that done. Mm-hmm. And it's because they have a specialty that they're able to um, you know, work on that they know that you don't know. So, oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, we'd love to all be, all be well-rounded, but it just doesn't always happen. Right. Yeah, it's yeah. asking a lot. It, it is, you know, it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, in terms of, you know, being a hunter ed instructor, Carson and I are both hunter ed instructors. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I appreciate that. It, it's a lot of fun. Oh, it's great fun. Get to meet a lot of cool people. But like you mentioned it earlier, you, you were, um, the local game warden and you're also the hunter instructor. Like I still remember that Dale Huff was my hunter ed instructor. Also the local game warden. Uh-huh. Still lives there, I think, to this day. Yeah. Um, but to me, that's what's really cool about being a hunter instructor is you could ignite potentially that lifelong passion into someone's you know hunting career. And it's how you guys set it up. There's not a lot that the hunter ed instructor has to do in terms of starting from scratch, right? Yeah. Like you guys give everyone the the blueprint to be successful, and I think a lot of people. Um, look at it as a daunting task mm-hmm. where they don't want to get into it essentially and be a hunter ed instructor. Yeah. What would you say to those, you know, men and women that do have an education, um, passion and and why it's important to get into hunter education? Do it one time and you'll feel you'll get rid of all that. It, yeah. It's just like going 
you know, um, elk hunting for the first time or deer hunting for it's intimidating or cl- cleaning that first deer. It's like, oh man, this is, I, I don't know how to do this. I can't do this. When it comes to hunter education, you're not going to be expected to do your first class by yourself. We ask that you do it under a mentor. Somebody will help you, whether it's your coordinator that you're working under, you know, because we have different districts throughout the state, your coordinator will help you, um, get into hunter education. First, we certify you to make sure your background's good. We don't want somebody with a, a shady background in our uh, ranks that would put some liability stresses on a department or you know, a team of instructors. So you, know, before you get yourself vetted to make sure that, hey, you understand the material. This is what you understand, a policy that we, we adhere to. And now we, we're gonna ask you to go under a mentor so that you can learn the proper way to start this process. And, and your first class might just be watching. And your second class might be teaching a segment of it. You know, some people come in, they just have specialties like, you know, I don't know anything about the rest of this stuff, but I'm really good with a shotgun and teaching people how to uh, shotgun techniques. Or I'm really good with, um, you know, just overall safety, but I don't know archery. I so like I mean, a muzzle loader is a good yeah, one. Oh, yeah. Kind of a specific you know, exactly. type of person. Yeah. So there's different people that, you know, fall into different pursuits. And if you have those experts in the field in your class, like, you know, if you have five good instructors, your team teaching, everybody's doing their passion. It's so easy to mm-hmm. do. When you're doing something that you're passionate about, it's easy. Being a game warden was easy because it was my passion, mm-hmm. right? This is what we had to do. If you're forcing yourself to do something that you didn't want to do, it's not going to be fun. Yeah. And it's going to be hard to continue to do. Yep. So, you know, that's that's what I would tell somebody who's just starting. Don't be feel intimidated. We're here to help you. We understand that <clears throat> you know, your first time, you, you know, the other thing is you have to have an attitude of that somebody might know more than me. Mm-hmm. And don't go in there with the aspect of, I know everything. Yeah. Because you're going to always learn something new. If you're not open to learning something new, yeah. you're going you're gonna to possibly fail or offend somebody. Yeah. You know? And you don't need to be the best person at archery or the best duck hunter, et cetera. I mean, this last summer we had a volunteer, um, had a long uh, background in, in wildlife biology or wildlife conservation, and he taught one of the chapters, and I learned a lot of stuff from his own experience and uh-huh. how he's, you know, aging uh, deer jaws and things like that. Yeah. Um, but to your point, yeah, never stop learning. But I think for a lot of people, like, you don't have to be the best hunter in the world no. to teach hunter education. You just got to teach the material. Yeah. And we prefer that they be hunters. Yeah. We don't want somebody that's just a gun safety advocate or who's just, ta- you know, trying to find a way of getting their, uh, um, their, Concealed carry classes more full by have inviting hunter ed instructors. We, I mean, hunter ed students. We want somebody who's there in the class that can relate to the student that might be going deer hunting. Like, how is that? How, what am I going to expect? Yeah. And we have a different type of other thing. Uh, uh, we might get into this later, but the advanced hunter ed program, which is the teaching, the how tos that we also need people for. You know, people who have an expertise in. Um, butchering deer or field dressing or whatever. Those are classes just in themselves that could happen where if they're really good at that, we could use their help in teaching those advanced hunter ed um, classes. And that's, that's service. You know, we're talking about this, this service actually works on volunteers' backs. And even though you guys, your instructors, you do it on behalf of CWA, you know, you have a program set up, but for the most part and, and, in uh, California, we ask people who, you know, hey, do you want to volunteer? You're not going to get paid anything, uh, but you're going to get rewarded in the way of sense of what you accomplish at the end of the class. Yeah. And we got a lot of that. And, and how many instructors are throughout the state, roughly? Right now, as far as uh, instructors, there's a little bit over 900 oh, actual wow. instructors, but the game wardens are also – uh, they add on top of that, so we're about um, eleven or twelve hundred, somewhere around there. Okay. Oh wow! I, I, I haven't really large. looked at the overall numbers lately, but we're a little over nine hundred, you know, volunteers, and then we have the addition of the game wardens who are out in the field yeah. that are certified when we're in the academy. Yeah. And so those add to the mix. Gotcha. Yeah, it's phenomenal. Yeah. So, I mean, we encourage them also to get out in the field, you know, and and teach those hunter ed classes, mix with the hunter ed uh, volunteers. 
so that it adds some validity to class. They're there to answer the laws and regulation questions mm-hmm. and and just, you know, meet their community. Yeah. How, you know, I started Hunter Ed back when I started with CUBA six and a half years ago and got a few years in of normal teaching and then COVID happened. So what what did COVID do for California Hunter Education and how did it change the system? It changed in a lot of ways. Okay. Um so when when it came and we had to figure out a way of offering hunter education because our biggest fear or as a team when we talked about this was losing uh, kids who had the opportunity to get their uh, deer applications in that year. Mm-hmm. You know, deer applications always do in June second, which yeah. is uh, coming up pretty soon, that. right? So COVID hit in March and. Anybody who didn't have their hunter ed done like that, couldn't and, apply. and if they didn't, if they couldn't apply for wow, that I deer didn't think tag, about that. I didn't either. that was a big thing. Yeah. You know, I mean, everybody knows how valuable the points are. Yeah, you don't want to lose an opportunity, especially <laughs> as a junior. Yeah. If you're not a max point kid, uh, you're not eligible for some of the hunts. Yeah. You know, just I mean, you're eligible. It's just that you have more chances. Yeah, yeah. and we don't want we didn't want to have anybody not be eligible for that. So we came up with, you know, like all a lot of states did, that an online-only course where they can go and do their course completely online <clears throat> and not have to see somebody in person. And that's something that went and happened. We didn't uh, – we, we implemented it. And uh, to be honest with you, like now I'd like to see it changed the way that that's offered uh, because it is – affecting the number of students that are attending in-person classes. Uh, I think there's a little bit of bad stuff going on as far as who's taking the course for who. Mm-hmm. And uh, you're not getting a vetted student. You don't know for sure that that student is the one who right. passed the online yeah. course. And then online is a lot different than in-person. I mean, it can be effective in some ways that, hey, there's no opportunities close to me. This is an opportunity I can do it at my own time uh, and, and, you know, pace. So it has some function. But as far as you and I learning, we learn more from each other, talking to each other face-to-face, mm-hmm. asking questions than just talk, looking at a screen. Yeah. yeah. You know? is, is there going to be a change anytime in the future, like to the online only be for a – certain age let's say like we we were working on a um a regulation to have an age limit on it yeah um it's still in the works i'd like to see it be in place sooner than later I, yeah i would like to see uh it be there before i retire so <laughs> that's the plan um we're, we're just working on that yeah because we we've have a lot of uh campers at our camp sprig events where you know, they did take the online hunter ed for covid reasons or whatever um yeah, and we we tell them, like, come come to a camp and retake it in person because mm-hmm. you are going to learn a lot. Oh, yeah. Um, and we had that this last year. But it's just, like you said, feel or in-person learning, it's just so much different. Yeah. You know, than I think the retention's the, better. I mean, yeah. you can't go wrong with the online ca- course as far as what's presented. You know that the material is right. always going to be presented. Yep. Yeah. It should always be understood. We as uh, human instructors, we might forget a point to stress in a class. Yeah. But I think the retention, if, if you make it a memorable opportunity, it's going to stick better into mm-hmm. that student's mm-hmm. um, you know, mind. It's like, and then plus there's a social aspect of it. Like uh, I believe you, know, you as an instructor, if you do a really good job in your class, that person's going to have like an ethical bind to you. Like you know, Carson yeah. said I couldn't do this, right? Yeah. And they're going to say you know, that if they had presented that question, oh, man, I can't do that. Carson yeah. really be disappointed. Right. You know, so there's there's some of that aspect that's in the class, especially if a game warden is teaching it. You know, they're going to know that. Whether it was – if it was a point-and-click thing on your computer, there might not be any, you know, bind, you know, emotional yeah. bind to it. Yeah. No, I, I agree with was, that. Was there a huge – I mean, maybe not huge. Was there a statistical increase in people that took Hunter Ed when they were able to take it online? Every state exhibited uh, what they call a COVID bump. Okay. So, like, when COVID hit, people were like, oh, my gosh, what's going to happen? Am I going to have to go hunt for my own food? I mean, even, even uh, um, firearm sales went up. Yeah. So, I mean, everybody was, like, really concerned, like, hey, uh, I'm going to have to make sure that I can get my – you know, legally get acquire some food in the field, 
And so we saw a, like over a 10% rise wow. in license sales. And um, over the last two years, that that has gone down. It's pretty much mellowed back so to what it was. So it's mellowed back to what it was. Interesting. And uh, those people are no longer you know, around buying the licenses. Or if they are, well, I'm glad they are because maybe there would have been more significant jump. I mean, a drop. And, yeah. and you know, because it has been a drop. The number of license sales has been dropping, you know, year after year. Um, but <clears throat> there was that COVID bump. Everybody experienced it where it was like really significant. And then it's gone back down since then. But can you speak to the number of people taking Hunter Ed every year? It's, it's a large number. And then yet all the states basically were either just staying the same or yeah. slightly dropping every year. Yeah. So California here, we we certify about thirty thousand students a year. So yeah. you would think, okay, well, you know, hey, four years, you you know, you got one hundred twenty thousand. Yeah. So yeah. your your license sales should go up that much, right? Well, we find that there's a lot of people who take the class that it takes them almost three years to buy a license. Oh, like, really? Like fifty percent of the graduates of Hunter Education don't buy a license within the first two years. Wow. <laughs> so it's like, huh. What did you take the class for? Yeah. Which I don't mind. I'd rather have people take a class and not buy a license than to not come to the class, yeah. right? We want, first off, Hunter Education not only explains why people hunt, but it pro- provides the firearm safety that maybe they wouldn't get anywhere else. Yep. And so maybe it's keeping their community safer. And it's giving people, you know, the people that we're asking that might not be non-hunters, you know, uh, they're not anti-hunting, but they're maybe non-hunters. That if some regulation or law comes for for vote, that they can make a educated, um, a, you know, choice on that. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's something that is beneficial to people taking a hunter head class, whether they hunt or not. I, I encourage people. It's like, well, I'm you know, if they say I'm not really into hunting, I, I don't think. I said, well, it doesn't matter. Wouldn't you want your kid to know what to do in case yeah. they come across a firearm? And then they come to the class, and it's like they have a better understanding of it. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're not just preaching, you know, oh, you should hunt or whatever. We're telling people why they hunt. We're telling um, them the considerations that are made when it comes to hunting, well, you know, the ethical decisions that people have to make, the laws and regulations, the um, – sporting sportsmanship you know it's not about getting all the game it's about progressing through the the whole ranks of being a hunter yeah and we talked about that earlier it's like you're not really concerned about how many ducks you get but you just want to go there's so much of that that happens nowadays and a lot of our hunter instructors maybe they're i don't want to say aged out of the field but they might not choose to to hunt anymore like for myself when i Go hunting. I go for the enjoyment of my, watching my dog. I have a lab that loves to hunt. You can see the passion in their mm-hmm. eyes. It's like just looking constantly, <laughs> right? But or that guest that you take that's never done it before, and how excited they are about it. I I can sit and watch a guest hunt all the time and yeah. just and just go through that. So the mentoring aspect of hunting, I mean that's that's more important now than getting seven ducks on my my strap, right? So. Yeah. Not everyone makes it to that sportsman stage. Yeah. But I think, like, we get a lot of camp moms and dads that, you know, are not anti-hunting, but, you know, they don't have a hunter education certificate. And we tell them, hey, since you're here, you might sit in the class. Sit in. And every one of them, it's like, I had no idea that hunters (laughs) did so much, you know, for wildlife or, you know, X, X, Y, and Z. Yeah. But, yeah, to your point, I think anyone that takes a hunter ed class, there's just so much more there than hunt what you would say hunter education yeah. um it's just so much more information about everything conservation yeah. preservation you name it yeah. um, i mean one of the questions on the test is what is the what does hunter education do well it's supposed to teach safe responsible knowledgeable and involved hunters yeah you know those are what we're looking for we're going to make you safe we're going to make you responsible making the right choices knowledgeable because you're going to be able to to tell people why you hunt what you're doing, you know, why you're doing it, and then being involved, joining NGOs like yourself, CWA, Ducks Unlimited, uh, Wild Turkey, whatever organization you want to, whatever your passion is. I mean, there's some NGOs that aren't present in California because, you know, uh, 
we just don't have that game, right? But uh, we don't have uh, <clears throat> Woodcocks or yeah. something like that. <laughs> but I mean, whatever their passion is, they should follow it and support it to keep it proliferating. And that's what we do when we're mm-hmm. part of those organizations. Yeah, I know yeah. the huge over the last years, uh, every time the sales, hunting sales licenses drop, mm-hmm. license sales drops. Um, and I saw you guys, I know we've done free fishing days in the past for California, and I believe it was this year was the first year we did free hunting days. Yeah, in November of this last year, we had our f- uh, first free hunting day. And you still had to have hunter education. It's just that you didn't have to go and purchase a license okay. uh, to go out and go hunting. It was just one day. And then this last weekend, we had our other one. There was another one this last weekend. Do you need to be mentored or is it just... You have to have somebody over 18 who's licensed be in your presence, yes. So so what's your guys' goal for that, just to get the people out that are like, you know, I have my hunter ed, but I'm not going to buy license. Oh, I can go out now if I have somebody to take me kind of thing or... Yeah, I mean, as as you guys know, uh, when it comes to hunting, people just don't go start... You know, yeah. it's like usually you're invited, you you have somebody who's mentoring you, whether it's a, a parent, a family member, a friend, uh, you're usually doing it under the guidance of someone else. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And for some people, it might be a um, economic, you know, uh, hurdle that to pass this. It's like, okay, I don't know if I want to invest all this money into this stuff that I don't know if I'm really going to enjoy it or not. So this is kind of their way of getting into it. Um, the one in November allows them, uh, they could have gone turkey hunting, they could have gone pig hunting, small game hunting. Um, you, you can't just do this that free day and go deer hunting. Yeah, There's, It's limited to certain species of, of game. Like this last weekend, it would have been a great way to introduce somebody into hunting, take them tur- wild turkey hunting. Mm-hmm. I mean, honestly, that is one of the ones... Uh, Besides duck hunting, where you get a lot of opportunities and counters, turkey hunting is pretty. It's a pretty fun ride, right? Yeah. And it's safe. It's very. Yeah. You can you can be in a real controlled environment of a of a ground blind. Uh, you can talk. You know, mm-hmm. there's opportunities for that mentorship to happen where you can put your hand on a person's shoulder and say, "Not yet." You know, you know, it's one of those things where you're not just letting them go off by themselves. Yeah. You yeah. know, because uh, having somebody go out in the field and and spot shoot, you know, quail and tur- you know, doves that that could be difficult. Mm-hmm. Yeah, where, especially the doves and yeah. pheasants and whatnot. Yeah. But. but even ducks, you know, uh, yeah. identifying what they are before you take your shot. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, you and I might know exactly what it is, hundreds of yards out there, but them to just go and shoot a duck that they might oh make a mistake. So, mentorship is always going to be the key to a successful hunter. So, you know, that's that's what we have to make sure we we have. But that basically it's it's basically avoiding the the high, you know, license sale okay. yeah, that aspect of it. They keep they keep going up. They don't go down. <laughs> no, no, they I think they're supposed to climb like 2% a year Ugh. honestly. Uh, yeah. I need to get By my regulation. lifetime so I can stop paying for I, it. I, I did that. <laughs> I yeah. Lifetime kids, yeah. hunting yeah, and you, fishing. You got kids too. You should start that now. <laughs> Save you money in the end. Yeah. 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 I think they're in the lower bracket right now. Yeah, probably. before they're not uh before they turn 10. You know, they don't have to have their hunter education. Right. You just buy it for them and once they get their hunter education, yep. that's when you can you know, purchase their, uh, they actually get their license. So yeah, do yeah. it. I, that's the one I did for my son. Oh, uh, really? I don't know if he knows what he has, but <laughs> yeah, he, not yet. Yeah. he will. One day when he yeah. buys his own, his kids. buddies are like, God, yeah. I got to pay for my hunting license again. Yeah. He's like, not me. Really? Yeah. Yours doesn't show up in the mail? <laughs> yeah. You know, right before duck season. Yeah. <laughs> that's weird. Uh, yeah, that was definitely a great investment because my son does hunt and fish and, and, you know, every year it's like, yeah. it's, he's already, uh, Gonna be twenty five this well, he's year. Already, oh, you've really? already made his so, money back. <laughs> yeah, and he started hunting when he was ten, so he he's definitely been hunting that whole time. And yeah. fishing didn't have to come till sixteen, but hey, fifty dollars a year adds you know, up. Over, that, it starts adding time. up. Yeah. Oh yeah, it does. So definitely get it if you can. <clears throat> what are some of the resources the CDFW provides for you know these newer? People, let's talk about the adult onset hunter. Yeah, you know, what's out there, and what are the resources that they could plug into to help their journey? So one of the big ones, and um, this was a position of mine uh, after getting the coordinator position, and when you know 
when in 2006 when I promoted to a coordinator, it was a district. So I was in charge of the hunter ed instructors in the district, which is basically like a principal. You're trying to make sure that the instructors are following the policies, that they're active, you're teaching classes. And then 2020, when COVID hit, uh, there was an opening for the advanced hunter education coordinator. And that's where I was talking about earlier. It's we teach the how-tos of hunting. Mm -hmm. And so we have a lot of product in that sense that's going out right now. Um, I initiated teaching via the webinars, you know, which everybody is. I mean, the podcasts, webinars, all those things grew during COVID mm -hmm. as, as an opportunity to reach out to people. And um, it was really cool to be able to do that aspect. I mean, teaching and getting people, I mean, I was available. I made myself available any, any way I could. It's like, call me, email me, whatever. Anything I can do to help you get to that next level and get past the hurdles that you feel are in front of you. That's what we wanted to do. So right now that position's held by uh, Lieutenant Eric Elliott, and he's doing an awesome job as far as the offerings that he has. I mean, he, at one time, I think he had over 50 offerings, whether it was a webinar or an in-person clinic. And the in-person clinics, we didn't resume until 2022 during that whole COVID time. Yeah. It was like that's when we got released to do it. And it was very unfortunate. My first clinic after coming out of COVID was a sausage-making clinic. And guess what? Who got COVID? Me. You know, I was like, oh my gosh, this stinks. How is this going to happen? And it wasn't bad, but it was just uh, that whole aspect of like, oh man, this is, how is this ever going to get going again? Yeah. yeah. But uh, it was such a fun class and everybody who was in there, it's like, I didn't advertise it just towards hunters. It was offered to the public. And there was a couple people from just that weren't hunters that were there and they mm -hmm. want to see what this was about. So, I mean, we all met and we... We had some venison. We had some wild pig. We had different types of meats that we made sausages out of. We had them for lunch, and everybody had a fun time. It was like, okay, that's that hunting community. Yeah. When you have that hunting community, honestly, to me, hunters and at you know hunter ed instructors are basically the echelon of uh, hunters. You know, because they're giving back constantly, and you know, it's a community that's really strong. Yeah. So when you're in that realm, and that's your realm. It feels good to be there. So, um, as far as what they were able to do at the wild, you know, the sausage clinic, um, they were able to see that, like, hey, this is a community that I'm part of. I, I had some new people, some newbies that came from my webinar aspect. They had never hunted before, and this was their first, um, you know, introduction to wild game and all that. So it's like, wow, this is fun and it's good and yeah, all those aspects. It was fun. It was a good time. That's great. But uh, we, we have classes like that. The webinars are just basically simple topics. We have them on our YouTube channel. They're there for viewing all time. I think one of the most popular one is the wild pig hunting in California, mm -hmm. um, public lands. Tough, tough subject. It's, it's hard. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 wild pig hunting is not hard. They're, I mean, easy. There's people who have them. Right. And there's people, you know, places that yeah. don't. So yeah, it's the, like the public land aspect of that is where it gets real hard. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. You know, we, we were telling them a lot. Uh, I had Lieutenant Matt Gill down in uh, San Luis Obispo County tell us about, you know, Hunter Liggett. Mm -hmm. It's one of the big public areas that does have a lot of pigs. Anywhere along the Central Coast is usually pretty he pig heavy. Uh, and, and there are some public lands where you can be successful. But the pressure that happens with pigs, pigs aren't dumb. No. They're not, they're not <laughs> dumb smart. animals. They're very smart. They're very uh, – they know when to leave, you know, mm -hmm. uh, they feed at night usually, and they, they leave the areas that are unsafe before light comes up. Or if you get mm -hmm. lucky, they're still there. You yeah. know? Yep. They're still a little hungry. But um, as far as, you know, those are some topics that are popular. We have a wild pig clinic where they can go in person and learn these same topics. They get to clean some pigs. Oh, wow. We have some uh, pigs that come in, and they get to actually sit there and get their hands dirty. You know, here's a knife. Go for it. And, and they'll process some some wild pigs. So that's that's like one of the biggest things when people talk about wild game. That's their one of their biggest hurdles that they're scared to reach. It's yeah, like, yeah. okay, now I got this thing. Now what do I do with it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, bird's easy. You can move it around, you can take it home, you know, but when you got a pig, you gotta take care of it now and in the field. Yeah. You know? I mean, I could relate to that. I mean, I, I grew up we grew up bird hunting, right? And my dad was not a big game guy and mm -hmm. I shot a pig in my 20s and 
I had never gutted an animal before. Mm. And I'm with the the guy that owns the ranch. He's like, well, I'll go, I'll go get the jeep and you know do your thing. And I was like, I've never <laughs> shot a pig. And he's like, you got a knife? I was like, yeah. He's like, all right, we'll do this here. Cut that. Throw that over there. Boom, you're done. And I was like, oh well, you know, it yeah. wasn't that bad, right? No. But thinking as a as a duck hunter, yeah, I was thinking like. Oh man, I, I'm watching YouTube videos. Yeah. You know, I'm researching it. Yeah. I was like, I know I can do it, but yeah. until you do it, you just yeah. don't know. Right? It's right? a huge yeah. hurdle. I mean, yeah. we run pig hunts through CWA, and I think I've been part of probably 35 pig kills in the last two years. And uh, a lot of the time, we can't drive into the ranch, so it's all quarter and pack out. I'm yeah, like, you guys know how to quarter. Yeah. No, all right, I'm going to teach you. And yeah. Here we go. And it's yeah. it's cool because you you get that teaching aspect just as you would during the actual webinars. Yeah. Like, yeah that light bulb goes, oh, it's not that hard. No. It's yeah. just intimidating. It, yeah. I mean, it's like a rabbit. You're just a little bit bigger. You know, you got a rabbit, you skin it, you gut it, you know, you quarter it. When, yeah. and, and it's just different aspects you have to think about. And sometimes you have time against you. Like, it could be 100 degrees. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you, you want to cool that meat down before, you know, you move it. You don't leave it in the hide because it's going to you know, start spoiling. It. Yeah. yeah. I think that's so. just a great thing about the <clears throat> webinars is just jumping over those small hurdles that yeah. are keeping people from going to that next level or yeah. pursuing whatever they want to pursue that just tiny little thing that's holding them back. That isn't yeah. actually yeah. a big thing. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I think a lot of people are, I don't know this or I don't know that. And it's like in this day and age, <laughs> there's a video on it. Probably, yeah, there's gotta be probably a hundred, several, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah do yeah. your research, but, yeah. You have to get over the the fact of like, yeah, you're not going to know your first time. Like if I yeah. were to go sturgeon fishing for the yeah. first time ever, I'm not going to know everything about sturgeon fishing, but you have to go to learn. Yeah. And that, that's what um, holds a lot of people back is they just are afraid to fail almost. Right? Yeah. yeah, definitely. Well, I think it's not a, f it is afraid to fail, but it's afraid to, I know a lot of people, it's like afraid to take something's life and then screw it up that, yeah. and not bring that meat yeah. back or, it's a waste. or break the law yeah. or whatever. Mm -hmm. That, that, that huge weight on somebody's shoulders. Yeah. It's like, you know, you may fail by not catching one, but if you fail in the cleaning aspect of it, that, that just ruins everything. Yeah. It's I would bad agree. experience. I would agree on that. Absolutely. Well, honestly, when it comes to game, the way you can fail is not cooking it correctly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, because oh, yeah. the people who uh, don't cook duck correctly, they're like, oh, my gosh, I can't stand duck. Yeah, the but they still want to go duck hunting. Yeah. And it's like, okay, wait, first off, you cannot cook it till it's brown all the way <laughs> yeah. through. Yeah. I mean, I've ate so eaten so many um, medium rare to rare duck rare. Yeah. and never been sick, right? Right. And, and it tastes it, good. It, it tastes good. <laughs> I've had people say, man, this is like filet mignon. Yep. Yeah. It's like, oh, my gosh, it's so good because the texture is fine. But you get too far one way, man, it tastes like liver. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't like it. And so we do have some cooking clinics in the advanced hunter ed world. Um, a lot of uh, some of the clinics that I teach, like I have an upland clinic that I'm teaching in uh, August, upland game, and uh, – um, they will have a waterfowl clinic, and I try to teach. I try to cook those during those clinics. It's not a cooking clinic, but we try to cover an A to Z type of thing. You yeah, know, that's a good idea. Set up, uh, you know, make some duck poppers at the end of the duck clinic, and yeah. it's like, oh my gosh, this, this is what I've been missing. Yeah, and you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you. When I was a game warden, uh, there's I know there's a lot of people that don't like to eat duck. You know, because you'd find them in the trash cans on the highway going back to San Jose from Los Banos. And it's like people would go hunting and they'd waste their game. And that's yeah. that's illegal. Yeah. They can't do that. But for some reason, they just they probably didn't know how to cook the duck. They never had it cooked correctly. And uh, it, it is, you know, there's French cooks that would just like, oh, my gosh, I would love to have that, <laughs> yeah. you know, duck. Or, that big you know. white rice fat yeah. pintail. <laughs> Yeah, but you talk to those people and it's like, yeah, oh, I had it on the barbecue at 400 for 30 minutes. Like, <laughs> no, yeah, that thing. Five minutes aside, yeah, that thing's going to be a brick. Yeah. You know? um, but no, we cover those type of aspects in, um, on, in our advanced class. Like I said, we, we want people to be turned on to hunting. We want them to, you know, we're not trying to make them completely successful. We're just trying to get their hurdles down because the retention part, you know, the, the big movement is recruitment, retention, reactivation. You know, we're recruiting the new hunters. We're trying to retain them by giving them successes, what they're searching for in the field. And then there's people who used to hunt, 
but they they just didn't really get it. They didn't get the full aspect of what it was. So they're trying to start up because maybe they didn't have the successes. You know, that's what you need to have in order, you know, make sure that they're meeting their their goals for hunting. Now, for us, it's changed. You know, it yeah. used to be oh, yeah. shooting our gun all the time. It used mm-hmm. to be getting a limit all the time or getting a trophy or whatever. That's kind of gone out the winter. We've progressed to those through those five levels of, uh, of a hunter. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm sure we're all sportsmen. We just enjoy the whole process of it, sharing it. And those are the type of people we want as hunter ed instructors. So if we have those people who are just not getting that satisfaction anymore as a, as a hunter – that hey, share that experience that you used to have with people. You'll your reward will be there at the end of the class when you're seeing the kid like with this certificate in his hand, saying, "Now I get to go hunting with my dad or my uncle or my grandpa." Those are the things that'll make you really happy with what you're you're doing. So yeah. if we can get those people to come join us, uh, hey, we're we're here for you. Yeah, and and. I think that's the, probably the coolest part of it when you do run into these. They were kids at the camps, and then they're grown men later on. <laughs> like, you're a hunter ed instructor. <laughs> and you're like, what camp? I remember your, your yeah. face as a little kid. But to me, that's the coolest part of it is yeah. that that person could then be a hunter ed instructor yeah. you know, down the road, and it's all because you had a part of it in yeah. that. You know? Yeah, I'm teaching kids uh, of kids I taught. You know? <laughs> yeah. So it's like it's it's gone that far now. It's like, oh, yeah. my gosh, I'm teaching your kid. You were here when, you know, 20 years ago, and oh, yeah. man. It's uh, it's kind of funny to see that, but it's rewarding. So, so we're going to kind of switch roles. Even as the hunter ed administrator, you're still technically a game warden in yeah. the state of California. Still got a badge. Still, still can, got a badge. Still right yeah. citation. Yeah. So what is the role of a game warden in hunting in California? Um, so, you know, this is actually one thing that uh, I ask the cadets when I teach there the, at the hunter education class. I'm, I'm at the academy first day and I asked, I said, how many in this class think it's their job to protect all the animals? And at first they're timid, you know, they're yeah. first like, <laughs> like this is the right answer. And, yeah. The it's answer. like, okay. This is the captain. Answer. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, you know, they all eventually raise their hand, yeah. you know, they see one, they see another. Yeah. It's like, really? Do your job is to protect all the animals? I said, no, it's not. I said, it's protect them from being taken unlawfully. Because your constituents out there in the field, the people that are buying the license, they want to take an animal. Mm-hmm. And if you're preventing them from doing that, they're not going to be around to keep buying licenses and you know, um, be part of what we, we serve. So um, my, my biggest thing, like teaching moment when I was a field training officer, it's like, hey, we want people to have fun out here. We want them to keep coming. Uh, we want to help them in any aspect that we can. Uh, when I was a field warden out there in the Sierras on a deer opener, if I saw a deer, I'd wait there until somebody came along so I could point out, hey, there's a deer, mm-hmm. you know, so they could get it. And what, what, who, who does that, right? <laughs> so, I mean, that's the thing that you kind of want to have is like, you know, um, just see it taken lawfully. You know, that's mm-hmm. the biggest thing. Let them know that, hey, you're an approach, you know, when you're teaching Hunter Ed, you're letting them know that you care about game. And that you you're not there as a bad guy. You're a cool guy. You're passionate about hunting, uh, but you want them to have fun with it too. Yeah. So I mean, that's what a role. That's what I believe that most wardens should strive to be is that community person, the game warden, if they can, that people know that they can go to for when times when people are doing bad stuff. Don't be afraid to you know. You know, they said snitches get stitches. You know, that's, <laughs> that's what some of those you'll see on some yeah. of those yeah. uh, wet forums. It's yeah. like, no, there's a there's an obligation. They're not stealing from, you know, uh, just you. They're stealing from everyone. Yeah. They're yeah. crooks. Yep. And that's what I want people like. Uh, uh, people who are doing bad, doing the wrong thing. Um, you know, they we're not. Tr- I don't know what to say. Is not trying to come in with a heavy fist, but we're coming in to educate. And tell you that hey, you're doing wrong by the sport, by the hunter, mm-hmm. not just yourself, your kid, or whoever else. Yep. So, hopefully, that's the message that people are getting. Um, it's weird though. Some people like think of game wardens like uh, we're always in a bad predicament. You know, it's like if we don't ask to see something, you're lazy. You know, 
if you uh, ask too much, you're being a tyrant because, mm-hmm. you know, what, you don't trust me? Uh, no, you're not doing your job if you're not asking. Yeah. There's different ways and tact in which to do it. You know, people should realize that that's our job. We have to yeah. do it. And then when it comes to, you know, when do we make contact? Do we make contact in the middle of a hunt? Do we make contact after the hunt? Yeah. You know, um, a lot of times when I was a field warden, uh, I'd be watching fishermen with a spawning scope, right? And you'd see them catch fish, and then you were looking to see what they did with the fish. Okay, if they threw them back, you'd w- just make sure everybody in the party is doing the same thing. But then, you know, you have a one guy who catches a short fish, and you see where they put it. And then you're watching the other people to make sure that, you know, see what they're doing. Because if you're going to go into a contact, you want to get everybody who's responsible for doing that action. Mm-hmm. And so there'd be times when, you know, maybe one guy was catching three too many before this other guy caught, you know, his first one that was too small and capped. So, I mean, you just want to be an efficient warden, you know, and uh, put that person in the books as far as like, hey, we got you on record. You need to clean it up. You know, you're going to have some repercussions, hopefully, for this violation. And maybe they won't do it anymore. Mm-hmm. It's not worth it. But there's some people, man, they just can't, um, they can't handle not. There's something in them where, like, I've had people snagging salmon and they just couldn't stop doing it. It was like so enjoying to them the ride of a, you know, salmon they're fighting on a rod that's tail hooked or something. They just, yeah. they couldn't oh. not have that. Yeah. So, what, what what can hunters and fishermen do to make sure that they have a good encounter with a law a enforcement question. officer? Oh. Um, well, um, so the first thing is know that their job is to uh, regulate, you know, the take of, mm-hmm. of game and fish, right? And that they, they have certain methods in which they have to do that. They're going to have to inspect the containers that you have your items in. We have search authority that allows us to you know, look into stuff that uh, most people don't get to look into where, you know, uh, a container that can hold game or fish is searchable by the department. And um, if a game warden asks you if you have something, you're better off telling them because they probably already know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, uh, that was my case when, when I'm watching somebody with a spotting scope from almost a mile away or over a mile away, yeah. and I, I go and ask you if you have a fish, any fish, and they say no. I say, you sure? No. I was like, you know, hey, if you don't tell me, you can be cited for an additional violation. It's called 2012, failure to show. I'm asking you to show me the fish that you have. Oh, I don't have any. And then you go find them, you know, <laughs> yeah. and you just cost yourself a lot more than if you, if you didn't. So, you know, step up to the, the violation if you're doing it. I mean, you can play the chance, but it is going to cost you more if, if you, you get discovered violating that um safety aspect wise there's different wardens who different do different things but whenever i contact hunters in the field the biggest thing i want them to do is just maintain the gun in a safe direction i've had two two accidental discharges upon approaching oh, somebody wow. with a uh, with a firearm because they got nervous mm-hmm. you know they just did things in the wrong order and the gun goes off and luckily for me and for them you know it was in a safe direction yikes but uh it, it's scary. So my yeah. my first command is, you know, I tell them who I am, keep your gun in a safe direction, and I'll come in and check it because I don't want a manipulation of the firearm, you know, if especially if they're nervous. You don't know who they are at first. Yeah. And, you know, as long as they're keeping in a safe direction, there's no issue. You know, most wardens, you know, you, you think about law enforcement when people with guns, uh, game wardens have to handle it a totally different way than most law enforcement does. You know, most law enforcement, they see a person with a gun, it's a threat. We have to come in and say, hey, hi, how you guys doing? <laughs> right? Can you imagine if you yeah. were put on prone on the ground for having a shotgun? Right. I mean, how that would work? Yeah. It doesn't work. So we as wardens have to have a different mentality. And I think our, you know, um, I know when I went through the academy, I felt really confident about what they taught us there. Mm-hmm. So, Yeah. So, but anyways, do the wardens prefer? I've had two interactions where this is what we did, but the game warden was a long ways away coming towards our group, mm-hmm. and we unloaded, and basically he was there and just actions open essentially, just because then the dog gets wild and is running around or, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. But it sounds like you probably wouldn't prefer that. You'd no. like to stay the same. Uh, 
<clears throat> there's certain times when you see people doing actions that are just like, oh, what's why going they, on? Why are yeah, they doing, why are they that? doing that? Hands are moving. Yeah, yeah it's, it's called furtive movement. Yeah, you know, yeah. something happens really quick upon recognition that you're there, and and it makes your you know senses go up. Yeah, and so uh, it can kind of heighten some certain things, but you know everything gets worked out in the end. But yeah. uh, you know, honestly, when it comes to you know, yeah, talking about your dog. You know, everybody, everybody thinks that their dog won't do so. Oh, it's, my dog's friendly. It's something about being in a uniform that, honestly, <laughs> I don't care how friendly your dog <laughs> is. I really want you to control them. Yeah. Uh, because it, it they change with people in uniforms. Huh. Yeah. I mean, you see it with the postman or Amazon. Yeah. You yeah. know, like, you know, I've my next door neighbor has a dog that when the Amazon guy is there, he's just out of control. But why? It's because of the uniform. Yeah. And it's totally different. I mean, what's different about that one guy? Yeah. That, yeah. you know, he Nothing. goes crazy. He could show up in normal clothes. That dog would be very loving. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, uh, the biggest, yeah, controlling your dog is, is big. Uh, just, you know, tell, follow the warden's directions. Say, you know, you can announce, warden, I have a uh, loaded gun. What do you want me to do with it? Yep. You know, he could tell you, you know, put in safe direction and load it. Or just put it down, lean it against you know the fence there, or whatever it may be. Uh, that's usually just just follow the orders. Yeah, and it's not really gonna be orders; it's gonna be asked. You know, there might be orders if you're not listening, <laughs> but it's just try to go along with the program. Right. They got a job to do, and they'll be out of there as soon as they can. And you know, I've been in the blind before, where I've I come in, I was checking checking blinds or people out in the field, and the ducks are coming in, and you know, I'm a duck hunter, right? I have a good time. So I said, hey, do you mind if I call this one in? I had my calls because I was like, you know, <laughs> undercover and say, like, hey, go for it. And so it was fun. I mean, who, how many people have people game wardens sitting in a blind awesome. yeah. call a duck in for him? Yeah. You know, so there's those types of things where some guys, hey, you guys want to shoot it? And, you know, they'll, they'll ask me. It's like, no, 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 go ahead. But uh, that's those are the stuff that you have happen in the field. Yeah. Like I said, my thirst for hunting was quenched a lot when I was a field warden. Because I was there every day, you know, seeing it, watching it. Right. So, yeah, it was a great job. I tried to get Carson to become one. I was trying to steal him from. He told me about that. Yeah. Why? CWA got me. Well, you could. Hey, you could have made a good decision. (laughs) You're lucky you're here. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Well, it's funny that you say that about the hunting situation because I know someone that was in a hunting situation. Game one came out and they were like, "Yeah, go ahead and shoot those," and they were like. Is this a trick? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Like, the trick do I have? Yeah. 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 And like, uh, no, no, we're fine. It's like, yeah. no, no, really, we'll sit down. And they're like, yeah. oh, no, no, just check us. Yeah. Out. No, I, 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 people do get angry. I was like, oh, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, as long as we're recognizing that you're doing stuff safe, you know, if, if you uh, were just totally doing the furtive movement stuff that made us kind of, you know, maybe we're not, wouldn't tell you that, but if it's just a normal guy sitting at a fence post waiting for doves, yeah. it's like, we don't want you to lose your opportunity. We want you to harvest and yeah. have fun. Yep. We'll check yeah. in a second, you know? Yeah. Yep. So. And my thing is, like, too, the hunt, you know, our um, campers or our um, students is, it's it's someone in uniform, you're going to treat them in, in respect and just act normal. Mm-hmm. Don't do anything out of the mm-hmm. ordinary. Um, greet them with a hello and a yeah. smile. Hey, how are you doing? How's your day? Yeah. And talk to them like a real human being. And the interaction to me, it goes really smoothly, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. Opposed to, you know, some people are like, I oh, had a bad interaction with a game war, and you talk to him about it, we're like, well, you were kind of being the aggressor, yeah. it sounds like, yeah. right? Of, I could be here, I could, you oh, know, yeah. whatever, yeah. you can't check my shells. It's like, I mean, I'm well, not a game warden, but I'm sure you can tell within the first five seconds how <laughs> that whole encounter is going to be. Yeah. Well, it's funny because, you know, we, we I hear stories, and it's like, you know what, there's always two sides to oh, it. Oh, yeah. And, uh, so I can't just go along with the public or the game warden. I just know that there's always different perspectives of it. So uh, you know, you try not to play referee in that aspect when, when me as a lieutenant or a previous field warden or captain hears something about a warden. It's like I know that there's always mm-hmm. there's something that might have gone on that he's not divulging to mm-hmm. you. Right. So if you hear a bad story, it could be uh, completely blown out of proportion or it could be – you know, the way that person was talking, like you said, they they were more of the aggressor. Right. You know, they were mad because their hunt was interrupted. At some point, we got to check somebody, yeah. you know. 
So uh, you're at no, sometimes it's a no win situation for us. Like, when do we check somebody? You know, why are you writing me a ticket? You know, because I didn't have my license on me. Well, that was, that's the actual regulation, and you couldn't show me proof that you had it. Right. And I can't just leave you here. You know, um, there's things like that, or, you know, a short fish. It's like, well, it's only half an inch. Well, (laughs) it's still short. short. (laughs) You know, it's still short. So, um, you know, there was times when I would say, well, I can't make this meet, you know, the 18 inches, uh, you know, show me how you measured it. And they still can't do it. It's like, oh, it must have shrunk in the sun. Yeah. Like, you know. Shrink in the cooler. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. We hear a bunch of stuff. So, uh, but no, I would say that most wardens, um, you know, they're, they're trying to do their job. Uh, like I said before, sometimes I would just check people with spying scopes. I'd never contact them. Mm-hmm. And as long as they were doing everything legal, from what I could tell, I wouldn't even check, you know, check them in yeah. person. And what are some of the things with, with talking about technology and things changing? You know, there are is that new app. That app. Yeah. yeah. So is is that a, a legal method to show yes. that you are yeah. compliant with mm-hmm. validations and things? Yeah, and just realize though it's a you know electrical device work. yeah it might not work somewhere so but it is uh we do accept digital proof of um pos- license possession now yeah we so. get a lot of questions on that yeah you know. yeah oh yeah so it'll yeah. make it easier for us in the morning i thought i had this off i'm sorry guys <laughs> you're good a it's a duck though it's right <laughs> if it's <laughs> lisa quacks yeah all right so let's say you have uh, um man or woman that's wanting to become a hunter ed instructor, what are some of the steps that they need to do and where to look for that information? To be so clear? on our uh, Fish and Wildlife website, um, there's two ways in which you can get to it. There's uh, You can either go to the hunting tab or the education tab. You'll find hunter education under both of those. And once you get to that, there's a, there's a menu on the side. It'll say becoming a um, hunter ed instructor. And on that page, it'll tell some of the quick, you know, uh, things that are going to be required, and it's going to have contacts. And the contacts are basically, you'll look at a map, you'll see where, where you live in the state, uh, which counties you're in, and there will be a coordinator associated with those uh, areas. That's their area of responsibility. Um, unfortunately, like, I'm at the top of that list, so everybody calls me first, <laughs> right? <laughs> so no matter what it's you for. You take your name off that list. I, I've been trying to figure out a Where's way your to classes? make it. Yeah. It's like, you know, the hunter ad- administrator, you know, yeah. top of the list. But uh, So that means I get all the calls. But um, they're supposed to call their coordinator first. And then if they're having t- trouble reaching them or for some reason they're not returning their calls, they could call me after that fact. But uh, – Try the coordinator based on the map and then um, start the process and uh, talk to other instructors. Attend hunter ed classes and tell the instructor that, hey, I'm interested in becoming a hunter ed instructor. Do you mind if I attend your class? Uh, just break in somehow. You know, the mm-hmm. biggest thing that obstacle that keeps people from trying stuff is just their fear because they just don't have the experience yeah. with it. So, yep. Yep. absolutely. You know, so. Get yourself out there. If you were in a hunter ed class with your with your son or daughter, and you didn't like the way it was going, step up and be part of the you know solution, not part of the problem. You know, don't complain to me about it. Uh, well, I mean, I like to hear if there's something <laughs> wrong, but you know, if you think you can do something, step up and do it. That's, yeah. that's I'm challenging people that you know the opportunities in your community are they're very rewarding once you get started in them. And, and the so, demand is there. People want to take hunter ed. They want to take hunter ed. Right now, our hunter ed instructors are seeing a reduced uh, roster, um, you know, compared to the past. And mm-hmm. so they're offering less classes. And that's having a, another a f- a domino effect. I want to see more offerings, even if the classes are small. Mm-hmm. Those are people that are not going to be pushed towards the online only. Yeah. You know, they're yeah. going to take a traditional class where you're going to be able to, you know, get them through the process and and they're going to have that interaction that social aspect that we all enjoy yeah. as part of hunters and i prefer hunters. the smaller classes i think the students learn more you get to interact oh, yeah. with them student more. ratio is great right yeah, yeah but when it's like yep. 50 students oh, in a you can, room you can lose them real quick especially mm-hmm. if you have a lot of younger kids mm-hmm. um it's really tough and i've yeah. only done those a handful of times but yeah. i did not enjoy those as yeah much. when i was first teaching in los mass they would do one class a year at the sportsman club in August, 
is usually like the A zone beer opener. It's like 110 degrees outside. <laughs> There was a hundred students in this sportsman's oh, oh, wow. with want, swamp coolers, right? <laughs> so it was a miserable experience. But we—that was their tradition. Yeah. And I, I did change it. I started doing things quarterly, more towards the cooler months, because that hall at the time didn't have AC. I was like, okay, we're not doing that. Yeah. It's it was too much. It was a long day. Yeah. You know, yeah. long weekend. No but uh, no, I mean, there's different ways in which students can take a class, a traditional class, which is what. Is geared toward more towards kid kids is a minimum of ten hours, of which two hours can be home study. So it could be an eight hour class if you get the book and complete the review questions and stuff ahead of time. But consider most most classes will be ten hours or over two days or mm -hmm. one day, and that's long. I, I prefer to have two days yeah. because it's or do the pre study stuff. Pre study stuff makes it when you come into the class. You have a better knowledge and understanding of it, so it's not your first time exposure to it, and they can pass the test at the end. Otherwise, having two days is really nice because it's more relaxed. Yeah. Yep, I agree with that. <coughs> well, we have one last question, Urban Legend. Did you, did you, did you in fact, write your father-in-law a oh. day violation? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, no, actually, I, okay, <laughs> let's clarify this. So the question he asked is, did I write my father-in-law a citation? No, I did not. Okay. It was actually my trainee, and it was like the <laughs> second to last day that he was with me, contacted my father-in-law on a bridge fishing, you know, the aqueduct. And uh, typically every year my wife and I would buy her dad a fishing license okay. to make sure he had it because I didn't want any embarrassment yeah. there. And so this time this uh, I, I saw him. I was like, oh, man, that's my father-in-law. And I told my trainee, oh, that's your father-in-law? So he contacts him and finds no license. <laughs> like, huh. <laughs> okay. And then all of a sudden this little plastic bag starts wiggling around on the on the. You know, ground there, <laughs> and there was a short striper, in it. Oh, <laughs> no. and uh, so we we he talks to me. He goes, "Hey, is this for real?" I said, "Do your job." So uh, good he, on you. He did his job, and that's why you're the and captain. That's, yeah. Well, <laughs> it was it was, thing it, it was an integrity check, yeah. but you know, what? it was probably the best thing that ever happened because he told everybody in town that yeah. I cited him. So that's the urban legend. Yeah. Which I didn't, um, but if I if he didn't get a, cita a citation, the opposite probably would have happened, yeah. right? Yeah. So then, what would I have to stand on? Absolutely. So, man of integrity, love yeah. it. Yeah. So well, now I don't know how everybody out there in the <laughs> air would think about this, me, but I, I when you're a field training officer, you have a responsibility. Absolutely. Oh, 100%. And if I if I didn't tell him to do what was right and ethical, then then my integrity, like you said, yeah. would have been questioned yeah no so, doubt percent no doubt about it yeah well, that wraps it up with our guest captain sean Olagi. uh thank you so much it's been a pleasure yeah, and thanks, thanks for guys. joining us I appreciate yeah, we, we appreciate you invite. coming out yeah you really it was do. fun it was yeah we can do this again for another topic absolutely <laughs> awesome. all right thank you thanks thank you for tuning in to this episode of save it for the blind podcast you can find our podcast on apple spotify or wherever you listen to your podcasts